Hey, welcome to the explainer. You know, 5G promises us this amazing future of instant everything, self-driving cars, seamless streaming, all of it. And it was engineered from the ground up to be the most secure mobile network we've ever had. But what if that digital fortress is actually built on a foundation we thought we left behind decades ago, a foundation with known, well-documented backdoors? Let's dig in. So this is the big question we're gonna tackle. That 20-year-old system is called SS7, and in the cybersecurity world, its vulnerabilities are, well, they're legendary. So is the 5G phone that's in your pocket right now still exposed to those really old-school threats? Stick with me, because I promise you, by the end of this explainer, you're going to have the definitive answer. All right, so here's our game plan to get there. First, we're going to look at why 5G was supposed to be a fortress in the first place. Then, we'll get into how its software-based nature completely changes the game. After that, we'll explore the exploding attack surface this creates, we'll touch on the whole geopolitical battleground, and finally, this is the big one, we'll reveal the crucial difference between the two types of 5G you're probably using right now. Okay, so let's start with the good news. The people who designed 5G, this global group called the 3GPP, they knew all about the security problems in 2G, 3G, and especially 4G. They were absolutely determined not to make the same mistakes all over again. And their guiding philosophy was something called security by design. Now, what this means is that instead of building the whole network and then trying to bolt security on at the end, you know, like slapping a padlock on a door after the fact, they baked security right into the core architecture from the very first day. And this had some really powerful immediate effects. So check this out, because this slide shows how they solved a classic spying problem. On the older networks, your phone was basically shouting its permanent ID, the IMSI, unencrypted for anyone to hear. This let people with a pretty cheap device called an IMSI catcher or a Stingray track you wherever you went. But in the 5G world, as you can see on the right, that permanent ID, now called a SUPI, gets encrypted into a temporary ID, a SUSI, before it even leaves your phone. And here's the bottom line. That one change makes those classic surveillance tools pretty much useless against a true 5G network. On top of that, 5G uses seriously strong 256-bit encryption for all your data. To give you some perspective, trying to crack a 256-bit key with every computer on Earth today would take, well, longer than the universe has been around. I mean, it is, for all intents and purposes, completely unbreakable. And they also went after another huge problem, roaming. When you travel, your phone carrier has to connect to a carrier in another country. Historically, that connection happened over that old leaky SS7 protocol I mentioned. 5G introduces a new digital gatekeeper, the Security Edge Protection Proxy, or SEP. Think of it like a bouncer at the door between operators, shutting down many of those decades-old backdoors. So on paper, 5G looks like Fort Knox, right? But what's the fort actually built with? And this right here is where our whole paradox really kicks in because all of that brilliant security that was designed on paper, it runs smack into the completely new way that the network is actually built. Okay, you have to get this one concept because it changes everything. The old networks were built with very specialized single purpose metal boxes. 5G just throws that entire model out the window. It's a network built out of software, a concept we call softwareization. And it's all powered by two key technologies. First up, we've got something called network function virtualization. And all that really means is taking a job that a physical box used to do, like routing your call or checking your identity, and turning it into a software application, an app that can run on any generic server, pretty much anywhere. This makes the network incredibly flexible and easy to update. And the second part of this puzzle is software-defined networking. This basically separates the network's brain from its muscles. It lets operators control the entire network just by writing code from a central dashboard. Think about it, a giant remote control for an entire country's mobile network. The benefits here are huge, right? Lower costs, amazing flexibility. But what's the flip side? What happens when you turn your nation's most critical infrastructure into one giant sprawling IT project? While well, you expose it to the very same threats that plague websites and corporate servers everywhere. Every single one of these things, from simple bugs and typos in the code, to viruses, malware, and all the classic web hacking tricks, they can now theoretically be used to attack the very core of our mobile network. The whole ballgame is different now. 
So, because everything is software now, 5G can offer these incredible new services. But every new service, every new connection point, just massively expands the number of places an attacker can try to break in. It's what security experts call an exploding attack surface. Okay, let's look at one of 5G's killer features, something that's only possible because of this software-first approach. It's called network slicing, and it totally redefines what a mobile network is. The idea is just brilliant. You take one massive physical 5G infrastructure, and then you use software to digitally chop it up into multiple independent virtual networks. Just imagine one giant superhighway, but now you can create special, totally separate, customized lanes on demand. So you could have one slice, one lane, that's just for autonomous cars, where a millisecond of lag is literally the difference between life and death. You could have another slice optimized for streaming 8K video to your phone, and a totally different slice just for millions of tiny, low-power smart meters that only send a blip of data once a day. But the danger? It all comes down to that one word, isolated. The software walls between these slices have to be absolutely perfect, because if a hacker can break into the low-security slice for smart meters and then find a crack to jump over to the slice controlling a city's power grid or its self-driving cars, well, you can imagine the results could be catastrophic. All right, next up is another huge shift, MEC, or multi-access edge computing. To get those near instant response times 5G is famous for, you can't waste time sending data all the way to a central data center and back. MEC pushes the computing power out to the edge of the network, way closer to you and your devices. And this just lays out the security problem perfectly. I mean, it's one thing to defend a single, massive, bunker-like data center. It is a completely different, and way harder problem to physically and digitally secure thousands of mini servers that are scattered all over a city, on cell towers and office buildings, maybe on a street corner. And finally, let's just think about the sheer scale of devices we're talking about. 5G wasn't just built for our phones. It was built to connect billions, maybe even trillions of other things, the whole internet of things. And this opens the door to a real nightmare scenario. You see, a lot of these IoT devices, cheap cameras, simple sensors, have notoriously weak security. A hacker could take over millions of them and then use 5G's massive bandwidth to unleash what's called a DDoS attack on a scale we've literally never seen before, maybe even taking down a nation's critical infrastructure. So think about this. If your country's entire communications backbone is basically just one giant piece of software, then the question of who writes that software and where they're from suddenly becomes a massive issue of national security. A lot of the debate you hear about companies like Huawei, it really boils down to two main fears. The first is the risk of backdoors, that a company could be forced to put hidden code into the network that would let a foreign government spy on people or even shut the network down. And the second risk, which is maybe even more realistic, is update dependency. A software network needs constant security patches. If a supplier suddenly cuts off those updates because of politics, a country's entire 5G network could be left vulnerable almost overnight. Okay, so we've seen the Fortress 5G was supposed to be, and we've seen how its software-based DNA creates this whole new universe of risks. Now, let's bring this all home. It's time to answer the question from the beginning. Is your phone at risk from those old school attacks? Well, the answer hinges on this one little technical detail you've probably never even thought about, because it turns out there isn't just one 5G. For most of us, right now, there are actually two. Let's break this down, because this is the absolute key to everything. Over on the right, you have 5G Standalone, or SA. That's the true 5G with a brand new 5G core network. But look on the left, 5G Non-Standalone, or NSA. This is what almost everybody is using today. To get it rolled out fast, operators took new 5G antennas for speed, but they plugged them into their existing 4G core. And that 4G core, it still speaks the old languages, like a protocol called diameter. And for compatibility, it often still needs to talk to good old SS7. I mean, this quote just nails it. You might see that 5G icon on your phone, and sure, you're getting 5G speeds, but the brain of the operation, the part that's setting up your calls and managing your connection, is still the old 4G brain. It's like putting a brand new jet engine on the chassis of an old car. And there it is. That's the answer to the question we asked at the very beginning. Because most of us are on these 5G NSA networks, we have inherited all the known security flaws of the 4G core. So yes, hacking techniques that rely on vulnerabilities from that 20-year-old SS7 protocol can absolutely still be a threat to the 5G connection you are using right this second.
Okay, so you're probably thinking, fine, but once we all get on true 5G standalone, this problem goes away, right? The ghost of SS7 is gone for good? Well, unfortunately, it's just not that simple. And that's because of something known as the cohabitation trap. For years, maybe even decades, our shiny new 5G networks will still need to be able to talk to the old 2G, 3G, and 4G networks. I mean, think about roaming in a country that hasn't upgraded yet, or just calling someone on an older phone. See, to make all this work, you need these translation gateways that can convert the modern 5G language back into the old language of SS7 and the other way around. And those gateways, those specific points where the old world meets the new world, are going to remain a prime target for hackers for a very long time. And that, right there, is the heart of the 5G security paradox. 5G did a great job fixing a lot of the historical flaws that allowed for that old-school telecom spying. But in the process of becoming this huge virtual IT network, it basically traded those old problems for a whole new set of threats, the exact same ones that cybersecurity pros have been fighting on the internet for decades. So, where does that leave us? It kind of makes you wonder. In our constant rush for faster and more powerful technology, are we just stuck in this permanent race? Are we destined to keep trading old, known security flaws for new, more complex, and undiscovered ones? It's a race that, for now, really has no finish line. Thanks for watching.